the concept of the golden circle, I mean, that's been around for years, but yet you've made something so obvious, just this new revolution, it seems. How did you come up with this movement? Well, it was born out of a personal struggle. Um, mm -hmm. uh, a few years ago, um, I had lost my passion for what I was doing. And um, it was this crisis that I was in that forced me to look for a solution. Mm -hmm. And I discovered this naturally occurring pattern that exists in all organizations and all of our careers. And I knew what I did, and I knew how I did it, but I didn't know why. And I had to know all three of those things. And I became obsessed with that one piece that I didn't know. Mm -hmm. After discovering my why, it changed the way I felt. I mean, I was excited to get out of bed again, which I hadn't felt in, in a while. And as we do when we discover something beautiful, we share it with our friends. And that's what I did. I shared it with my friends. And they started making crazy life changes. And then they invited me to their homes to share it with their friends. Mm -hmm. And so it was all, it was all very organic. Um, you know, the idea, this concept of having a sense of purpose has existed for thousands of years. I, I certainly didn't come up with it. But I found a language that made it really easy to understand and really easy for people to sort of um, transpose this concept onto whatever they're doing, their business, their careers, whatever it is. So it's really the language that's special, not, not necessarily the concept. So you have this idea. Did the book come before the TED Talk? The, they came out about the same time. I did the TED Talk in uh, September of 2009, and the book came out a couple months later. So how did that happen? How did the book come out? Yeah. Um, I, well, this concept was already a few years old. I had been talking about it, and I'd mm -hmm. been in, already um, had a sort of a, a bit of a speaking career, getting invited to speak about this concept. And somebody said to me, "You should write a book." Mm -hmm. And I went, "Okay, you know." Mm -hmm. And um, somebody who believed in my cause introduced me to the publisher, and I met with Adrian Zakheim, who's the god in business publishing, the original mm -hmm. publisher from Good to Great, and the publisher of all Seth Godin's books. And so the folklore goes, we had a 29-minute meeting, and three <laughs> days later, I had a book deal. Wow. So um, again, I, I, I preached my cause and not necessarily sold, try to get a, a book deal, you know? Um, and it resonated with him, and he took a risk on me, because I was nobody. Um, so I'm very grateful to him for taking a risk. So what does it feel like when you go to the bookstore and you see your book right there? <laughs> Is it kind of weird? Well, it was, it was <laughs> when it first happens, when it first mm -hmm. comes out, it's, um, it's, it's kind of amazing, you know, to yeah. see your name amongst these things. It's, m it's more surreal. It's, it's like when you go to see a show and you know somebody in the show, you can't mm -hmm. actually watch the show, you just watch your friend, you know? Mm -hmm. It's the same idea. Mm -hmm. um, um, but, you know, it's, um, I, used, I remember we used to, I used to go and make sure like they were all neat, <laughs> try and make them face out if I could, you know? Um, That's funny. Yeah. So for the past two years, you've been working on a second book. Yeah. So how did this come about? Um, second? Yeah. The, you know, I was sort of resigned to the fact that, you know, I was going to be a one-trick pony, you know, mm -hmm. and, you know, it's a good trick, but it's, yeah. a, it's one trick. Um, um, and I, you can't force an idea. It's mm -hmm. like you can't tell someone, think of something big. It's like, I don't know. Right. And so I'm a curious personality, and I, I'm constantly doing things and learning and paying attention. And I'm also not married to anything from the past. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm sort of, I ha there's this Baz Luhrmann, the director of um, uh, Moulin Rouge and mm -hmm. Great Gatsby, he has a wonderful concept of his work. He, he, he says it's like a child, where he invests everything in his life on his baby, you know, mm -hmm. and he sacrifices and gives, so it will grow up to be wonderful. And then when it's finished, he puts it out into the world, and it sort of m creates a life of its own, and he mm -hmm. goes on to the next thing. And people will come up to him and say, oh my god, I love Moulin Rouge. And he'll say, oh, how is he? <laughs> say hi for me. You know, it's, it's kind of that, that idea. And I have the same attitude, sort of, this book is out there, this TED Talk is out there. I believe in it mm -hmm. desperately, I live by it, I preach it, but it's, it's taken on a life of its own. And so m the experiences that I've had since have created, so I'm just curious and think, looking at the world, and I realize that even when you start with wine, people come together. Mm -hmm. What we desire more than anything else is to feel safe. Mm -hmm. We want to feel safe with the people we love, with our friends. Mm -hmm. This is what vulnerability means, right? Mm -hmm. It means I'm willing to fall asleep and trust that you won't hurt me. I right. mean, you know, it's, it's that I will expose myself to danger mm -hmm. and that you won't hurt me, you know? Mm -hmm. That's what vulnerability means and that's what we all want. And the, the place that it's as valuable as in our relationships is at work. Mm -hmm. And if we feel safe at work, if we're in the circle of safety, if we feel safe at work, then we can together cooperate and trust each other and concentrate on the dangers that exist outside of work. Competition, new, new technologies, you know, uh, um, uh, the market, whatever it is that we're facing, we do it together. But if there's danger inside the, the organization, if we don't 
have a circle of safety, if we don't trust each other at work, if we don't trust management, if we think that they would sooner lay us off to save their numbers than, mm -hmm. than sacrifice their numbers to, to save us, mm -hmm. you know, that's bad. And then we're going to concentrate all of our energies internally that makes the company more exposed to the dangers outside. Um, and so again, it comes from my own experience, which is, you know, I have a, a little business and I, and I want to feel safe. You know, I'm, I want to feel safe uh, uh, amongst the people that I work with. Mm -hmm. and, and you start to realize that you hire people who are very talented, but, but are they like you? You know, mm -hmm. will they look after you? Will, do you want right. to look after them? Right. So, so that's how it came about. Also organic. So when will it be out? Um, touch wood, <laughs> January of next year. Awesome. So, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but you've done a lot of work with the military. Mm -hmm. they, you've researched heavily, and that's a big part of this second book, right? Mm -hmm. So can you talk a little bit about your experience? Like, what's the coolest, most inspiring thing you've seen so far working with the military? I've, I've been very lucky um, to work with them. They're mm -hmm. just some of the most remarkable people I've ever had a chance to meet. You know, in, in, during World War II, the population of the United States and the number of people who were in the military um, was about 16%. So 16% of the country wore uniform, which is pretty remarkable. Wow. Now, including active reserve and um, and National Guard, it's less than 1%. Less than 1% um, wear uniforms. So most people don't interact or know people in the military. Mm -hmm. And um, they're remarkable human beings who are devoted to this concept of service. And not mm -hmm. service necessarily to their country, though that's a part of it, but service mm -hmm. to each other. Mm -hmm. And I've learned more about what it means to be human from these remarkable people than I have from anybody else. You know, mm -hmm. I've, I've been hugged by more people in uniforms than I have in mm -hmm. suits. I've cried with more people in uniforms than I have mm -hmm. with suits. Um, and I've sat in audiences with commanders giving uh, a briefing, and I've sat there and cried. I've never cried when a CEO gave a speech. Um, and so they're all very special experiences, but I think perhaps the most powerful one that sort of really did change me, I had the opportunity to go to Afghanistan with the wow. Air Force. Yeah. Um, and it was the, the head of the mobility forces said, you know, you spend all this time with us. I'd really appreciate it if you actually went and saw our men and women performing their mission, mm -hmm. would you be willing to go? So of course I said yes. I didn't tell my family because I didn't want them to worry because there's nothing I could, you know, I couldn't call them while I was there. Mm -hmm. So I told them I was going away with the Air Force, which was true. I told them I was going to Germany, which is true. <laughs> I told them I'd be out of touch because I'd be on a lot of uh -huh. planes, which is true. I just didn't tell them I was going on to <laughs> Afghanistan. Um, so we landed in Afghanistan and we'd been on the ground for maybe 10 minutes. The, the door on the side of the plane was open, the big mm -hmm. door on the side of the KC-135 and uh, the base came under rocket attack. And uh, you can hear it. I mean, we heard it fly in. Mm. And that was my introduction, like, oh, like welcome. welcome. <laughs> now, I later learned, I later learned, just a few weeks ago, uh -huh. in fact, I learned that there were actually three rockets that landed, and they landed 100 yards off our nose, wow. which I didn't know, <laughs> and I'm kind of glad I didn't. Oh. Um, so that was the introduction. Um, then the next morning we went and did an airdrop mission, which is incredible. Mm -hmm. We sort of flew out of, you know, for an hour, dropped down to 2,000 feet. The back of the C-17 opens and, you know, all the cargo flies out the back mm -hmm. with parachutes to supply an army forward operating base. And then when we got back to base, the goal was to get out of there now. You know, mm -hmm. we, we'd done our primary mission and now we wanted to leave. And uh, we were waiting to get on a plane um, and it was an outbound aeromedical taking wounded warriors out of, out of theater. And um, at the last minute, we were sitting on the plane all strapped in, and the last minute they told us that they had to bump us because they needed more room for stretchers, which mm -hmm. there's a, if there's ever a good reason to get bumped from a plane, right. that's it. So then we went to try and find another plane to go home on, and there were none. Mm -hmm. And so I was, um, it was only a Saturday, and we were told that there wouldn't be another flight going to where we're going until at least Tuesday, and then there's still no wow. guarantee you get on the plane. So I'm gonna be late, I'm gonna be stuck in Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. I have no reason to be there, you know? Mm -hmm. I'm stuck in Afghanistan. I can't call my family. Wow. Um, and um, I just remember feeling like com like my whole body, like everything sank. I remember getting sort of depressed. Mm -hmm. And I started to become paranoid as well. I started to be convinced there was going to be another rocket attack. Mm -hmm. Like I was convinced there was going to be another one. And I was convinced it was going to land on me, like mm -hmm. wherever I was living. Like that's where it was going to land. And so it was really sort of a really unnerving. And I remember becoming very tense. And I remember becoming mm -hmm. sort of a real bastard to people, you know, sort mm -hmm. of sort of like telling them what to do, and I, I don't do that. Right. Um, and uh, I went and lay in bed while, you know, we just went back to our room, and I was just lying there, and I closed my eyes. I couldn't sleep. None of us had slept for more than a couple hours mm -hmm. every night. Uh, one guy said, I'm going to see if I can find another 
plane. And the other guy said, well, I'm going to go to the gym then. You know, mm -hmm. turned off the lights and they left. And I lay there and it was the hardest thing of my life because I didn't want to be there anymore. I regretted everything. And I realized this is what it was like to live, to be in a dead end job. Like I had a compressed, which is we have moments of excitement, but we confuse that for being happy. You know, right. the reality is we have these moments of excitement, but we go to bed in the morning uh, at night and we don't want to wake up and do it again. Mm -hmm. And that's what I was doing. That's mm -hmm. how I felt. Mm -hmm. And I, I look, I'm in the purpose business. And so I sort of tried to come up with a sense of purpose. And like, you're here to tell their story. Mm -hmm. I was like just making things up. Right. It didn't work. And so I gave up. I just resigned myself to the fact that I was stuck here and wow. there was nothing I could do. And it was at the point I gave up that I decided if I'm going to be stuck here, I might as well make myself useful. So I would volunteer to speak to whomever wouldn't wanted to listen. Mm -hmm. And I would go help some of the nice people I met and volunteer to carry boxes or sweep the floor. It didn't matter how menial. I was happy to help. Mm -hmm. At the moment I decided to serve those who serve others, I instantly felt better. I was even excited wow. to be there. It was sort of a remarkable thing. And it was a, as if it was a movie. The timing was uncanny. Just as I had come to this conclusion and found this calm, the door burst open. And it was Major Throckmorton. He says, I got us on a plane. I got us on a plane. We have to leave now. We have to leave now. There's been a plane that's been redirected. We have to leave now. Mm -hmm. So he's like, where's Matt? I'm like, he's at the gym. So we <laughs> rush over to the gym. We get the, other, the, we get the other officer who's accompanying me. And the three of us rush out to the plane that we're supposed to get on. We get to the flight line. And the flight line has been shut down because they're having a fallen soldier ceremony. And um, out of respect, everything stops while they have the ceremony. And I sat on the curb and told the guys what I went through and cried like a baby. And finally, when the cordon went up, we walked out to our, mm -hmm. our plane. And uh, what I haven't told you is the reason this plane was redirected is because we would be flying home the soldier for whom they just had the fallen soldier ceremony. Wow. We were the only passengers on board with the crew, three of wow. us, and one, and one precious piece of cargo. Wow. And, um, and we waited on the plane, and the Army brought on the flag draped casket, like you see in all the pictures. Um, they laid it in the middle of the plane, gave an eight count salute, marched off the plane. We could watch them hugging and crying when they walked off the plane. And uh, the crew got to work and strapped the, the casket down. And we took off for our nine and, a half flight, nine and a half hour flight back to Germany. And, you know, we sat there, just there was the casket. Mm -hmm. And, you mm -hmm. know, once we were in the sky, it was an overnight flight. Mm -hmm. You know, everybody grabs a little piece of real estate and pulls out their sleeping bag mm -hmm. and you try and get some sleep. Every time I opened my eyes, you know, yeah. there was this casket. And um, I was never, it was the greatest honor of my life to having just learned what service means, you know, that it's about giving to those who give to others, um, to have the honor of bringing someone home who knows much more about service than I will ever know. Wow. And, um, you know, when I got home uh, back to the States, um, you know, something was really, really strange happened to me, which I didn't expect. I was really short tempered for like a whole bunch of months where I would be on a hair trigger and like everything pissed me off. And mm -hmm. like if I missed my flight, I'd be mm -hmm. furious and I'd call my assistant and I'd ream her and it was not her and she didn't do anything. And I would like call the next day and apologize and say I was mm -hmm. exhausted. That was the reason I couldn't figure out why I would be so short tempered because right. I'm not really short tempered. And um, but when I would go to a military uh, event, for example, um, it doesn't matter what went wrong. It didn't matter how hard You're I worked. Fine. I could get up at seven in the morning, and they would work me till ten o'clock at night without a break. And I had endless mm -hmm. energy, and I was fine. And I realized is when I had the opportunity to serve people who serve others, I had endless amounts of energy. Mm -hmm. And when I had to be in positions where I wasn't serving others, it was just for the money or whatever mm -hmm. it was, I, I had a short temper. And so I worked. I started working very, very hard to really be even more discerning. I was pretty discerning back then, but even more discerning. Mm -hmm. um, so I won't work with anybody who I don't believe has some sort of service mindedness because it'll make me angry and upset to do it. And literally all I can do is think about the money because I don't want to do it. Right. Um, and so it had a profound effect on me. It, it really did. And, and so I've, I've worked very hard to, 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 to keep that up because it's, it's, it's good for the health. Can you talk about the story you, were, you mentioned to me the other day, um, the, in, the richest man in India wanted you to do? <laughs> Come on. <laughs> and why you didn't want to do that? Uh, we don't need to talk about that. No? <laughs> no. <laughs> okay. I mean, in a nutshell, I had an opportunity to work with someone. Um, but you know, their, their, their conditions, as, as cool as it sounded, uh, their conditions were that I had to make myself available you know, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And uh, that's not something I wanted to do. So the point is, it's about service, serving others you know, who serve. Yeah, I mean, yeah, like as, as I said before, this what this new book about is, you mm -hmm. know, it's is we want to work with people who make us feel safe. Right. And that means that they 
have our interests in mind. Right. And when they have our interests in mind, we will put their interests in mind. Mm -hmm. And so when our leaders and mm -hmm. our bosses and our managers make it their job simply to care about how we feel, how mm -hmm. we're doing. That doesn't mean we can't get in trouble. Of course, you, you know, you, we love our children. You can still discipline your children. Right. You know, it doesn't, but when we do something wrong, we don't fear we're going to lose our jobs. If the, if the numbers at the end of the year are bad, we don't fear we're going to be laid mm -hmm. off. Like, we feel safe. Mm -hmm. And when we feel safe, we commit all of our energy to see the company and its interests advance because that's what human beings do. Mm -hmm. You know, children want to make their parents proud mm -hmm. because their parents have spent their whole lives looking after their children. That's the, that's that's natural. That's what human beings do. When right. we look after those who look after us, it's just what we do. And so the companies that commit to looking after their people, that extend the circle of safety beyond just management, but all the way to the edges of the company, those are the best companies in the world. And only when that circle of safety reaches the edges and the lowest level employees mm -hmm. will then it be able to go out to the customer. Mm -hmm. And then it's really cool. And then the customers are invited in. Mm -hmm. But if you can't get it out to there, then there's no incentive for the customers to join either. Right. So kind of switching gears, what were you like as a kid? Like what, what were your dreams growing up? I mean, I was a dorky kid. You know. um, <laughs> uh, I, I, it's a very funny uh, thing, you know, you sort of think about what your childhood dreams uh -huh. are. I, I wanted to be an astronaut. Really? I went to space camp, yeah, 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 I wanted to be an astronaut. Um, and, uh, you know, obviously I mm -hmm. have not become an astronaut. But the funny thing is, if, if somebody asked me recently, why do you want to become an astronaut? I, and I, I actually know the reason, which is mm -hmm. I wanted to become an astronaut because I wanted to go and do things that most people, go do something that m most people never get to do, mm -hmm. look down at the Earth and have a perspective that most people never get to have, and then come back and share that perspective with people. Like, mm -hmm. I've always wanted that, mm -hmm. you know? When you meet astronauts, they all have this amazing perspective and view of the world, and they're right. all pacifists because you can't see borders and things like that. And, uh, and I sort of stopped and thought, and I'm like, that's kind of what I do now. I get to see the world from a different perspective, mm -hmm. and I get to come back and share that perspective with people, and hopefully have some sort of positive benefit in the world. So although I never went to space, I am an astronaut. Um, so I, I guess I am living my, my childhood dream, which is sort of fun. That's really neat. Mm. So who inspires you? Well, I mentioned the, I mentioned the folks in the military. Right. Um, you know, they're, they're, they rank very high on the list. Um, just their level of commitment to each other is something, is something inspiring. Um, um, and their willingness to sacrifice for each other is, is inspiring. When you meet one of these heroes who has been in a situation where they have risked their life for someone else, mm -hmm. they don't want a bonus. They don't want a promotion. They're not looking for a reality TV show, you know? Mm -hmm. And you think about how, you know, if anybody goes a little bit above and beyond at mm -hmm. work, you know, they want promotions, they want bonuses, they want, like, everybody wants the reward for right. what they did. These guys don't ask for it. You know, they get it because someone else recognizes mm -hmm. it, but most of them are pretty humble and don't even talk about these things. You ask them about their amazing experiences, and they, they look at you and go, well, that's my job. Right. You know? And it's <laughs> sort of like, no, I don't think it is, but okay. <laughs> um, and then you ask them, why would you risk your life for someone else? And they mm -hmm. all say the same thing. It's because they, because they would do it for me. That's what they say. They would have done it for me. Wow. Um, and so that's, you know, there, there's a few specific personalities that, that that I, you know, the conversations I've had with them and the lessons I've learned from them, I carry with me. And I, I want to be like them. I try hard to be like them. You know, I will never be like them, but mm -hmm. I, will c I can try hard. Um, and uh, they're pretty remarkable human beings. Cool. So if there is one thing you could change in your journey, would you? Anything you'd take back, do differently? I mean, you look back at experiences that weren't fun or that were hard or that were mm -hmm. struggles, but at the end of the day, d those things became lessons and helped form who I am. You know, right. like the whole concept of the golden circle and the concept of why came from a came from pain. Mm -hmm. I never want to go through that ever again. But do I regret it? No. Right, because it led to it led to this. this you know, yeah. it led to this amazing journey. So it's a hard question to answer because you know I don't know mm -hmm. what what went into helping me. Mm -hmm. You know, I I'm sure I could find a few things that yeah. didn't. <laughs> um, so, you know, I don't know. It's like people, I grew up all over the world. I grew up on four mm -hmm. continents as a kid. And people sometimes ask me, you know, don't you wish you sort of had roots somewhere that mm -hmm. you could have lived in one place? And I'm, I was like, I don't know. It's like I have nothing to compare it to. That was my childhood. I have mm -hmm. no basis to say what's better or worse. That's mm -hmm. all I know. Mm -hmm. um, and I wouldn't have changed it because it was awesome. Right. You know? Are there advantages to having roots somewhere? Uh, sure. But that's not my experience. So it's the same thing. I, I can't say that I would or wouldn't change something because I, I don't know what 
what the impact. You know, we all think that I wish I went to a different college, but then you wouldn't right. have made those friends, and right. we don't know how things unravel. Didn't you go to law school and then you switched? I dropped out of law you school. You dropped out. Yeah. And what happened after <laughs> that? <laughs> well, I, I was going to law school in England, and I uh -huh. was dating somebody who was studying advertising, and she uh -huh. said you should look at advertising at about the time I was becoming disillusioned with the law, and uh -huh. so you know, like our careers are usually accidents. So thanks to Rebecca Lemberger, I had a whole career in marketing. You know. So let's talk about success. What would you say is your number one secret to success? And it can't be starting with why. <laughs> <laughs> That's easy. No, no. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I don't. The, the, there's no secret to success. Mm -hmm. It's. I don't think it's a secret. Right. Um, success is a team sport, mm -hmm. and the success that we have is always because of the generosity of others. Somebody who took a risk on you, somebody who took a bet on you, somebody who risked their um, um, reputations to recommend you, um, somebody who took you under their wing and gave you their time and energy, somebody who watched your back, somebody who when you forgot to do something, they mm -hmm. did it without you even knowing. There's mm -hmm. people who've helped you out that you didn't even know helped you out. Mm -hmm. And you know, I think success is the acknowledgement that, it's, that you didn't do it all. You know, and the right. and and if you've enjoyed any what the world would perceive as success, however you want to define it, happiness, financial, fame, whatever your standard is, mm -hmm. if you enjoy those things, um, it's because other people watched your back and believed in you and believed that you had something that they wanted to be a part of, which is why they they chose to join you. Um, and so, you know, the secret is, I guess, it's not you, and you got to be grateful <laughs> to those around you. Um, and I think that for me, when I go back and look at that period where I learned about the concept of why, those were the two biggest lessons I learned, which is, one, I don't have to know all the answers, and two, I don't have to pretend that I do. And to be open to the idea that you don't know everything, and other people know more, and no matter how much you know, mm -hmm. you know this much, Right. you know, that's, the secret is, is that you don't, it's not you. <laughs> so I assume you have a mentor, or a few mentors, I'm sure. I do have a couple. That you meet with regularly? Um, I talk to them on an irregular basis. And how important is that, do you think? Especially for my generation. You know, I think mentorship is so important. Um, and I know a lot of peers of mine, they, they want a mentor. They don't necessarily know how to approach somebody. Yeah. How would you suggest? So it's a, it's a really good question. Um, you know, sometimes I get asked by people, will you be my mentor? Uh -huh. And the question is, is why, you know, do I say yes or do I say no? And, right. and to, them it's, to them, it's only a little bit of time. It's only, you know, an hour a week. Uh -huh. but if I do it with two people, that's two hours a week. And right. with three people, it's three hours. Before it you know up. it, before you know it, you're a professional mentor. So you have to be discerning. As the mentor, you can't say yes to everybody, even if they wanted, and even though it'd be wonderful to help. So what's the standard, you know? Um, and at the same time, as the mentee, like who am I going to ask, you know, to give up their time, and that I have to show up? And it happened to me recently, where I met someone who was truly remarkable, mm -hmm. and we had this fantastic meeting. And at the end of the meeting, he said, "Will you be my mentor?" Mm -hmm. And I said to him, only if you will be mine. Huh. And that's my standard for mentorship, which is I don't believe in mentor-mentee, that one person is the mentor and mm -hmm. one person sort of the mentee. I just mm -hmm. don't believe in it. I believe that the successful mentor-mentor mentor, mentor relationships are when both people have something mm -hmm. to teach and both people have something to learn. And so only if I want someone to mentor me mm -hmm. is somebody I want to mentor. And that way, it's it's give and take, and it's much more balanced. Otherwise, you have this weird power dynamic that one person knows and the other person doesn't. You know, and the reality is, it has nothing to do with age or experience. It has to do whether we believe that someone has something that we would like to learn. Mm -hmm. um, and and when that me that feeling is mutual, I believe those mental relationships are the best. And all of the mentors I have, even those who are much older than me and much mm -hmm. more successful in every standard, right? You know, I'm always amazed by this. I'll say to them. You know, one, I'm thinking one in particular, my, my friend Ron Bruder, you know, I would always say to him, Ron, you're my mentor. Mm -hmm. And he's like this super, super amazing, successful guy. And mm -hmm. he'd always look at me and say, and you're mine. <laughs> and I thought he was like making fun of me for the longest time. Right. You know, and then I realized it's not. He actually gets something out of the, the, the relationship and the conversations we have. So I think we're, we're out of time, but is there anything else you wanted to, to add that maybe we didn't cover? Um, no, just like I'm, you know, I'm on this kick, you know, I'm on this mission, this, this, this sort of journey to talk about the fact that we are all responsible for each other. Mm -hmm. all, we are all we have, mm -hmm. you know, and together we can do anything and face anything. And so just a little reminder that, you know, when our instinct is to blame someone or criticize someone or to take for mm -hmm. ourselves, that um, in the short term and the long term, it, it won't work out. Mm 
Mm -hmm. um, and just to sort of, when someone yells at you, maybe be concerned that maybe they're in pain. Like, are you okay? As opposed to saying, don't yell at me. You right. know? So the idea of just being a little bit sort of more empathetic with people on a daily basis, mm -hmm. whether it's a barista or someone you work with, goes a long way. And it feels good.